Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America on the Blue Funk Broadcasting Radio Network. Great to have you with us on the program today. Have you ever asked how God's knowledge of the future impacts your life today? Frustrating God, a new book, offers a challenge to the assumptions of open theism and provides answers that are both refreshing and new. Scholars and lay people alike have struggled with the extent God's knowledge, the limitations of human free will, and the practical applications these ideas have for everyday life. The author of the book, Frustrating God, is Pastor Lewis Scott. He graduated from Moody Bible Institute with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Bible Theology with a Greek emphasis. He then received a Master of Divinity from the Northern Baptist Theological Seminary. While serving in the U.S. Army as a chaplain, Pastor Scott completed the clinical pastoral education at Eisenhower Medical Center. And after retiring from the Army in 2007, Pastor Scott started the Ambassadors of Christ Ministries in Columbus, Georgia. The ministry includes an English-speaking congregation as well as a Spanish-speaking one. Life Skills University is part of the Ambassadors of Christ Ministry. And he's with us on This Week in America, Pastor Lewis Scott, talking about his book, Frustrating God, How Open Theism Gets God All Wrong. Pastor Scott, welcome to the program. Interesting show. Great to have you with us on the program. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, sharing with you some of this information about uh, the struggles I've had personally with uh, with this particular subject. Well, and a lot of people go through these struggles. In fact, uh, uh, a lot of people grapple understanding who God is and all of these questions. And I understand from reading the book, this really goes back to basically when you were a child struggling with all these issues and talking to other people and, and trying to find some answers. Yes, yes. Uh, it is one of the things that uh, I've been uh, very, very concerned with theological issues from a very young age. And uh, God has always brought me back to uh, the certainty of scriptures and the reliance on scriptures. And so I have a very inquisitive mind regarding these issues that, as, as relate to theology. And so uh, when I read uh, some of the information about open theism, I decided I had to go in and investigate this further just to clarify my own thoughts. Well, and it's interesting when it was just you and you were not pastoring a church, you sort of struggle with that, and now you're trying to lead other people, and I'm sure they're coming to you with, with their questions, so now you not only have, have to satisfy your own curiosity, you have to satisfy everybody else in the congregation's curiosity as well. Right. I, I've had uh, the, the privilege in, in a couple of occasions to talk with people regarding these issues of uh, uh, God's sovereignty and, and his uh, foreknowledge of the future, and uh, it really can open some eyes when we begin to understand uh, the knowledge of this God that we really cannot understand, and sometimes it's very frustrating to us. Yeah, and I don't want to give the impression that you've now figured it all out, because as I understand it, reading the book, Frustrating God, How Open Theism Gets God All Wrong, this really is, even for you, someone who, a scholar who has spent a lot of time studying this, this really is, is an evolving process for you as well, isn't it? It is, it is. We, uh, I mean, nobody can really claim at any given time that we have discovered who this God is, and and the full knowledge of God. Uh, we have glimpses of him as we read in scriptures and we try to search his character in scripture. But all of us have to be honest enough to realize that uh, we don't have all the answers. And, and, and this God is very elusive precisely because he is so uh, awesome to us. The book is Frustrating God, How Open Theism Gets God All Wrong. Let's first of all talk about open theism. What is it exactly we're talking about? Well, it is, a, uh, it is a theological movement that probably originated in the uh, mid-1980s, although we can trace it back to further back to a gentleman named Lorenzo Macab, uh, who wrote a book about the nascent uh, necessity of God in, this, in the 1800s. But the movement itself began in the 1980s um, with um, several gentlemen that wrote a book, uh, in between them Clark Pinnock, uh, John Task Hasker, um, a gentleman uh, named John Sanders, they wrote this book about the openness of God. And the openness of God basically stated or states that God does not know the future because the future does not exist to be known. And even God is, doesn't have any information regarding the future. So in a nutshell, without trying to be uh, too simplistic about it, the, the open theist uh, position is that the future does not exist and not even God can know it. When you were sorting all of this out, you cite several examples in your book, Frustrating God, How Open Theism Gets God All Wrong. By the way, the book is available at AmazonBarnesandNoble.com. 
You can go directly to Pastor Scott's website, frustratinggod.com. Of course, go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and, and link on that way. Uh, as you're going through this and, and setting this all up, you had a couple of examples in your life that you feel lends credibility to your interpretation. One is it's 2002, you were a chaplain, and you really, well, you're ready to go to Korea. There's no if ands, and buts. That's, that's sure. where you're going to go. Uh, and then you sort of got a prophecy that, no, that's not going to happen. Explain that briefly, how that happened in your life and, and, and the meaning it meant to you. Yeah, this, this is one of, the, one of those weird things that happen in a person's life uh, that we have, I have no other explanation except God's involvement in the process. I had volunteered to go to Korea in the year 2001 uh, so that my wife can stay in, in the city of Augusta, Georgia, uh, to facilitate my son, my youngest son, graduating from uh, the same high school as my other three children had done. And so I volunteered to go to Korea. I had received my orders from, from the Army. I had received my letter of, of welcoming from uh, the commanding general in Korea and from the command chaplain in Korea. I had received my assignment uh, to uh, my unit in Korea when in the month of February of 2001, a gentleman whom I have never met, don't know who he was, he came to Eisenhower Medical Center to visit his sister who was dying of cancer. By one of those coincidences of life, I was the duty chaplain that, that week. And uh, after intervening with them, the sister unfortunately did die that same Saturday. And, and after spending some time with them, that Sunday the man asked me what I thought was a strange question. He came to the chapel service and I was responsible for the chapel service. And he asked me the question as to what were my plans? Now, I never met this man, so why would he be interested in my plans? I had no idea. And so I said to the man, well, you know, my plans are I'm going to go to Korea, allow my son to graduate uh, here in the school, the local school in Augusta, and then when I return back from Korea, give the army three or more years and retired. And he said, well, God sent me here to tell you that you are not going to Korea. At, at that moment, I didn't know exactly what to say because I already had my orders. And so I gave the man the answer. I have orders already. And he says, so um, your mission here is not complete. Uh, that kind of threw my life a little bit upside down because I've never had an experience like that happen to me when this man tells me this. And so I began to talk with my wife. How is God going to do this? I mean, I don't have any idea how a chaplain who volunteered to go to Korea can get out of that assignment. I couldn't figure it out. And uh, a few months later, the weeks go, went by. I had to continue doing my processing and getting preparations to go to Korea. And uh, in, in late April, about six weeks before I had to start my leave, uh, I get a call from the chief of chaplain's office into my own personal phone. And the chaplain on the other side, I can remember him. And uh, he says, how would you like to go to uh, a command and general staff college um, after, uh, in, in your career. And I said, that would be absolutely awesome because it was for a chaplain, a very special school at the time, only three chaplains would get selected per year. Uh, and I had not been selected because uh, I had already attended a different military school and that made me ineligible to go to uh, the Command and General Star College. And so I told him, well, you know, that would be awesome if you guys can send me, but how, uh, you know, you will do it after I get back from Korea. I will receive that. And he said, well, you report to Fort Benning, Georgia for the school uh, on January of 2002. And I said, but that will put me in Korea only six months. Uh, were you going to give me full credit for it? And then he says the words that wrong uh, have been ringing in my head ever since. He said, uh, your, Korea, your orders to Korea will be deleted on Monday. And as you're going back in your mind, this really isn't coincidence. As you just described, there's so many things unique to the situation. It mm -hmm. would be pretty hard to say, okay, this just actually happened on its own. Oh, it is absolutely, absolutely impossible. I never met the gentleman, never met his, his uh, sister. He had no connection with the military. Um, I had no connection with him in terms of the chaplaincy, orders process, anything that has to do with human uh, resources in the military, um, he, would have to, he would have to somehow get connected with me being selected to a school that I was not selected for in November when the board met. 
And the other thing that there was no way for anyone to know is that another chaplain who had been selected for the school uh, could not attend for personal reasons. And, and literally, out of the a hat, they picked my name to take his place to go to that school. It is just absolutely flabbergasting that, that he could make that prediction in February and almost three months later for it to come exactly as, uh, as he had predicted it. It was just absolutely amazing. The book is Frustrating God, How Open Theism Gets God All Wrong. In open theism, is there any room for prophecy of any kind? Or since the, the basic premise is God doesn't know the future, you just sort of eliminate prophecy. Well, it, it is one of the biggest problems. I think that, that the issue of prophecy is the Achilles heel of open theism. They have not provided any particular insight into the issue of prophecy. Uh, Clark Pinnock at one time said that uh, many of the prophecies in the Bible uh, were not fulfilled, and, and the implication in his writing was that the that God had probably guessed that it was going to happen, and it didn't. Uh, he almost lost his uh, ordination credentials from his denomination until he finally backpedaled and, and backtracked from that. Um, Greg Boyd has said about the issue of prophecy, of course, that God doesn't know the future, but he has said that God had remarkable knowledge about uh, the crucifixion. Uh, the Bible doesn't say that God had remarkable knowledge about the crucifixion. It says that he was predestined before uh, the foundation of the world. And so they do have a major, major problem with the issue uh, of prophecy, and they have tried uh, on a cer- certain locations to kind of like do away with it, but I think that the attempts have not really been very effective. What type of response have you gotten from those that followed the principles of open theism? You make such a valid argument in a number of ways, in a number of circumstances in the book, Frustrating God. Are you converting some of these people to to what you're saying and what you are <laughs> logically laying out to them, or are you getting blowback from them, pushback from them that, no, you've got it all wrong still? Yeah, well, I actually, I've uh, had not much interaction with people uh, that are proponents of open theism, but I've talked with several people who are uh, kind of like followers or, or individuals who have been attracted to the possibility. And in presenting some of my my points, they have not been able to come up with, with an answer. Uh, a friend of mine who read the book, uh, Dr. Steve Smith in, uh, in Florida, he read the book and he said the, the, the way that the arguments are presented in, in uh, Frustrating God are devastating to open theism because you're using the exact same examples that they take and the exact same verses that they use and you have explained them and present them in such a way that makes the, the theology of open theism uh, unsustainable. The book is Frustrating God, How Open Theism Gets God All Wrong. The website is frustratinggod.com. The book available at Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. The author, our guest on This Week in America, is Pastor Lewis Scott. Let's talk a, a little bit about what this means to the to the average person out there. Someone, for example, let's say in your congregation, once you make this case to them, what does it matter in their lives, the way they go about living their lives? And I guess it comes down to, do you believe in God understands and is aware of the future or not? But what does this mean to the average congregant in your church? Well, one of the things that, uh, that uh, as a practical matter, is extremely important about God's knowledge of the future has to do with the issue of prayer. Uh, if we are asking God to intervene in our lives through prayer, and, and this is a very practical matter. And God does not know how the, how the response to those prayers are going to unfold. Then what we're basically saying is that if God does not know the future, he will answer prayers that have unintended consequences even to God. In other words, God can answer a prayer to someone that, completely honest if he doesn't know the future without knowing that the answer of this prayer to this person is going to create havoc in that person's life. And if you think that's a little far-fetched, and I really, uh, I'm not grasping the concept, in the book Frustrating God, you've got a great example from pop culture, a movie, uh, Mm -hmm. the movie Bruce Almighty, and explain that basically is is using this concept, and it it really has some serious consequences. Yes, yes, it does. It it is very interesting in in that uh, movie, the uh, Bruce Almighty, when uh, when Bruce received uh, supposedly the powers from uh, from God, played by Morgan Freeman, uh, to to 
organize the world, if you will. But he actually he was only working with a group of people in Buffalo, New York. And at one point, Bruce answered all the prayers to everybody in, in yes. And he created all kinds of problems uh, all over the world by the reaction, the chain reaction of these prayers. There was even a funny part of a woman who lost 40 pounds in the movie on the Krispy Kreme diet, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a, a very funny situation, but but when it comes to the issue of prayer, it is it is a a tremendously significant aspect of Christian life. We are encouraged to pray at all times. We are encouraged to depend on God for um, for the answer to our prayers. We are encouraged to pray for healing. We are encouraged to to pray for God to intervene in in simple matters as as getting a job or protecting our children, etc. And if God doesn't know the future. How is he going to even get into the business of answering prayers to anybody? I just don't even, I cannot even imagine the possibility of God answering a prayer that has uh, negative, ultimate, unintended consequences to him, uh, even worse, to us, who, are, who will be the recipient of, of those unintended consequences. The book is Frustrating God. A couple minutes left in the program. Our guest on the program is Pastor Lewis Scott. His website is frustratinggod.com. The full title is Frustrating God. I hope in theism gets God all wrong. How long did it take you to actually do work on this book? It is very easy to read. It's very well researched, makes a very compelling argument. How long did it take to actually, and, and I guess let's go back to, when did you decide this is such a major issue and has implications that I'm, I'm going to take the time to research and write the book? Was it difficult getting to that decision? It, it was at, at first, because initially when I read uh, Gregory Boyd's uh, book, which was uh, released in the year 2000, I read the book, I think, 2001. I was still in the military and uh, as a chaplain, didn't really have the time to be writing per se, a book. And so I decided uh, at the time that I was going to just write an article for myself uh, to clarify my own thinking on the subject matter. And and I wrote the article and then I continue adding some things. And maybe a couple of years later, I said, I probably need to turn this into a book. I shelved it. Um, personal issues that happened in terms of health in my life. Um, couldn't be working on the book. But then uh, a little bit after 2007, when I retired, I began to actually do some serious research. And I said, I'm going to see if, if this actually is the type of subject matter that can, that can be turned into a book. Because my own curiosity is, uh, is um, I need to satisfy that. And maybe there are others who have the same curiosity. And so in 2007, I began to do some further research. And I found um, notations from the 1800s uh, philosophers in, in, in uh, the first century that had proposed uh, libertarian free will and a few other things. And I began to realize that, okay, this is something that I need to take uh, more seriously. And it was probably towards the end of 2007 that I said, time to write it. And um, over the next uh, three or four years, I began to put the thoughts together the best way possible, being that this was my first venture into writing um, I cannot even begin to explain the the uh, pain that it took to get this thing done. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to got about a minute left on the program, and it is your first endeavor, and it's not only trying to tell the story, but it's almost uh, lawyerly, scholarly in the way you have to go about doing this. To, you can't just say something. You need to back it up to, to, to make it have impact. You have to back it up, and you've done yes, that. Sir. Did you feel any divine inspiration as you were going along the way here? You know, the one thing that I can that I can tell you is uh, um, when it comes to the issue of divine inspiration, I think that the that my experience in 2001 uh, with Mr. Jackson uh, definitely was a was a word from God. There was no question about it. I am convinced of that mostly because it happened exactly the way he said it. Um, and so that was intervention from God. But there was a, another time uh, when as I was doing some research and reading about uh, Peter's life uh, regarding uh, Jesus, uh, Peter's denial of Jesus. When I was reading Peter's life, there was an inspiration about Peter. We sometimes use Peter as someone who was too quick to speak or too emotional or too impulsive, etc. And he has been accused for denying Christ many, many times as being a coward. And, and it was almost as if Peter was speaking to me. He was not a coward. Peter uh, did not deny Jesus because he was afraid. He denied Jesus because he did not want to die without a fight. 
Uh, and those are two very different perspectives. And to me, that was a unique inspiration uh, in terms of scripture that I really had not had before because most people have accepted the idea that Peter uh, denied Christ out, out of cowardness and, and not because there was a, uh, something lacking in his spirit about humility, which are two different things in my mind. Well, as you're reading the book, it's obvious you went into this with an open mind, wanting to find an answer for yourself that you could share mm-hmm. with others, and you've done an mm-hmm. excellent job. The book is Thank Frustrating you. God, How Open Theism Gets God All Wrong. Pastor Lewis Scott has been our guest on This Week in America. His website is frustratinggod.com. The book is available at Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, and you can get all this information uh, link on it at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Pastor, excellent job with the book. Fascinating reading, Frustrating God, How Open Theism Gets Thank God you. All Wrong. Pastor Lewis Scott has been our guest on the program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Rick. God bless. God bless everybody. You're listening to This Week in America on the Blue Funk Broadcasting Radio Network.